Now, as much as I wanted to talk about the Bone Daddy assassin himself, I did promise a video on Ishtar. So let's take a closer look at the ancient Mesopotamian goddess who rivals Aqua for the title of most useless. Don't get me wrong though, she's incredibly powerful and even intelligent. It's just that her stubbornness and pride often prevent her from making the best decisions. I mean, she literally decimated a mountain because she was jealous of how beautiful it was. And that actually ended up manifesting itself as her planet shooting noble phantasm. But then there's also her human host body which has put some serious limitations on her natural divine capabilities, causing her true powers to remain unused. So let's start with her mythological origins, then shift over to her lesser known abilities and noble phantasms. But before we get started, this video is sponsored by Crunchyroll. With Crunchyroll.com slash news, you can get a free 14 day trial of Crunchyroll Premium today, giving you complete HD ad free access to not only Fate Grand Order Babylonia, but also Fate Zero, Fate Stay Night, and even Prisma Ilia. Then there's also the highly anticipated Tower of God adaptation coming out in spring, which if you don't know anything about, it's one of the most popular manhwa out right now. And just like all the other anime and manga on Crunchyroll, It'll be available to stream with professional subtitles on pretty much any mobile or desktop device. So go ahead and use crunchyroll.com slash news, link in the description, to get your 14 day free trial of Crunchyroll Premium today. Now, let's get back to the video. Ishtar's existence originates from many Sumerian poems, each written thousands of years before even the time of Christ, back during the Mesopotamian Age of Gods. This was an era where humanity and divine beings could walk the earth together and one of those divine beings was Ishtar. During this time, Ishtar would become the most famous goddess in Mesopotamian history, specifically for her role in two key stories, one in the Epic of Gilgamesh and the other depicting her descent to the underworld. All these myths would eventually lead her to become known as the goddess of love and war, a goddess who was never quite satisfied with what she had. She would constantly take part in these conquests, always trying to further extend her personal domain. One poem in particular tells a story of how she stole sacred artifacts from the god of water and human culture. These artifacts held divine powers that allowed humanity to exist as a society. This was because within them were concepts like truth and victory, social constructs like law and kingship, and even technologies like writing and weaving. Initially they resided in Ea's city of Eridu, a place once considered to be the focal point of Mesopotamia. But after Ishtar stole these artifacts and brought its knowledge and power to Uruk, Eridu could no longer be considered the center of the land. Uruk rose to power as the central Mesopotamian city. Another poem writes of Ishtar's rise to fame as a central goddess in Mesopotamian culture. Before Ishtar became a prominent figure, many temples worshipped her father Anu. At the time, Anu was considered to be the supreme god, whose existence represented the entire universe. From him came all the other Mesopotamian deities, and somewhere within Uruk there existed a temple dedicated to his worship, the Temple of Yana. Yana was well known as the House of Heavens, and Ishtar despaired at the fact that this temple wasn't part of her domain. Her exact motives weren't quite clear, but she felt that it was something that was rightfully hers. The thing is, no one knew where this temple actually was. Ishtar had to travel far and wide until finally encountering a fisherman who could guide her to the temple's location. Once there, Anu was shocked by Ishtar's arrogance. The House of Heavens could very well have been the most sacred temple in all of Mesopotamia, and here was Ishtar attempting to take it for herself. Despite how bold this was, Anu still decided to let Ishtar have her way. So the temple became part of her domain. With that, Ishtar would become known as the Mistress of Heaven and the patron goddess to Uruk. Many believe that this myth was meant to represent a shift in Mesopotamian culture, a shift from one that primarily worshipped Anu to one that worshipped Ishtar. As time went on, Ishtar would continue her conquest to expand her domain, and one day she would come across the divine king Gilgamesh. He had just returned from the cedar forest after slaying the creature Humbaba. Ishtar was captivated by Gilgamesh's beauty and kingly prowess, so seeing Gilgamesh as something that she desired, she proposed that they become married. Now, Gilgamesh was well aware of the fate of Ishtar's previous lovers. Ishtar was recorded to have many different intimate relationships with gods and humans alike. Of the ones recorded, there really aren't that many that had a happy ending. One ended up being dragged to the underworld, another was permanently changed into a wolf, and another turned into a mole. 
So, to get into a relationship with Ishtar was questionable to say the least. Gilgamesh obviously didn't want to go down a path that would inevitably end in suffering, so he outright refuses Ishtar's offer. This was a pretty rare experience for Ishtar. Things usually go the way that she wants them to, and when she wants something, if not handed to her on a silver platter then she'll simply just take it by force. But Gilgamesh wasn't something so easily attainable. He completely disregarded Ishtar in a rather insulting manner, comparing her to the likes of a faulty battering ram or a poorly fit shoe, both things that end up doing more damage than good to the person using it. Needless to say, Ishtar's pride was now in ruins. She returns to the heavens and demands that her father release the Bull of Heaven upon Gilgamesh. As we know, if not for the combined effort of Gilgamesh and Enkidu, then this divine beast would have destroyed Uruk in its entirety. Fortunately, the two were able to slay it. Once again, Ishtar was left embarrassed by Gilgamesh. Enkidu even went so far as to mock Ishtar's divine beast by tearing off one of its limbs and waving it in her face. Of course, this just went to enrage Ishtar even more. She returned to the gods again and demanded that both of them should die. You see, Gilgamesh and Enkidu had committed the sin of slaying the beast of the gods. It was prohibited for any being in a human body to slay the bull of heaven. So the gods had no choice but to act on this offense. They decreed their punishment, and Enkidu decayed back to the mud from which he was formed. That was Ishtar's role in the Epic of Gilgamesh. Now, as even more time went on, Ishtar's conquests would result in her becoming the patron deity of many more Mesopotamian cities, and her desire to further expand her domain would only continue to grow. Eventually, she set her sights towards the underworld of Kur, the shadowy underground of the earth where the dead reside. This was a domain currently ruled by her sister Ereshkigal, and that was something Ishtar was looking to change. This brings us to the myth of Ishtar's descent into the underworld. Unlike Gilgamesh's epic, this isn't a story of rage, but rather one of tragic romance. Sort of. In fact, it's one of the world's oldest known love stories. Kind of. You see, Ishtar was once married to a shepherd, and as far as we know, she did in fact love this man. But Ishtar was still in the middle of her conquests, still trying to expand her domain as far as possible. The Underworld was looking to be a great place to claim for her own, but in order to do that, she first had to take it from her sister. Before descending, Ishtar instructs her servant to send for help if she doesn't return within three days. This is because the law of the Underworld states that no person can leave once they enter, at least not without Ereshkigal's permission anyway. So, under the pretense of attending the funeral of Gugulana, Ishtar was able to enter into Kerr. But Ereshkigal wasn't so naive as to let Ishtar descend all the way to the bottom for free. She ordered the gatekeepers to bolt the seven gates of the underworld shut, then only let Ishtar pass through each one when she has removed one of her royal garments. The thing is, these royal garments were more than just flashy pieces of clothing. They were representations of Ishtar's divine power, and every time she passed through a gate, her power would further decrease, sort of like how she got smaller and smaller in the anime. The myth takes it a little bit further though. When Ishtar finally arrives at Ereshkigal's throne, she was completely naked and powerless. But even with that disadvantage, this didn't stop Ishtar from attempting to usurp Ereshkigal's throne. Needless to say, it didn't really turn out all that well. Ishtar was powerless to do anything. She was then judged to be guilty of hubris and sentenced to death. So, how exactly does a goddess get executed? Well, her physical body was turned into a corpse, then hung from a hook. This left Ishtar trapped, because once a deity's body is killed in the underworld, they can't escape from it. After three days passed, Ishtar's servant went to plead for help from the other Mesopotamian gods, of which only Ea was willing to help. He sent creatures of his own creation to bargain with Ereshkigal for Ishtar's body. In exchange for the gift of clean water, the creatures were able to make a deal. As they carried her body back through the gates of the underworld, Ishtar was given each of her royal garments back, restoring her divine powers to how they once were. Once out of the underworld, Ishtar was revived via Ea's food and water of life. However, that wasn't the end of it. There was a rule of the underworld that couldn't be broken. Because Ishtar left, someone or something needed to take her place. If someone couldn't be found, then Ereshkigal's demons would drag Ishtar back to Kerr. It was pretty hard for her to decide who to send to the underworld, since she didn't want to send anyone who was her devout follower. Ishtar always had a soft spot for those who worshipped her. But when she finally appeared before her husband, he didn't look the least bit worried about her being gone. 
Instead, he was lavishly clothed on Ishtar's throne while being entertained by slave girls. Obviously, Ishtar wasn't very pleased, so she decreed that her husband would be the one to take her place. He attempted to flee, but the demons were very persistent. No matter where he went, they would follow. And eventually, Ishtar's husband would be dragged to the underworld, ending what she thought was their happy marriage. So, those were her myths that are a bit more relevant to her fate self. As we saw in episode 12 and 13, there were a lot of references to Ishtar's descent to the underworld. Now, the Ishtar we see in Fate Grand Order isn't the actual divine spirit of Ishtar. She's an archer servant manifested within a human body, an existence known as a pseudo-servant. As a goddess of war and chaos, normally Ishtar would be much more cruel in the way that she approaches certain things. Don't get me wrong though, she can still be a compassionate goddess. It's just that her impulsive nature results in her being a lot more reckless than what we see in the anime. The reason for this is that having possessed a human vessel has resulted in both personas to merge together. Ishtar's is the most dominant, but the honest and kind-hearted nature of the person she possesses suppresses her destructive tendencies. They only ever emerge as her Sundere outbursts. Basically, this version of Ishtar is a lot more patient. If you want to see what Ishtar is really like, then you're going to want to look into the Fate Strange Fake version of her. She's a lot less appealing than her Fate Grand Order counterpart. Anyway, now let's take a look at how strong Ishtar really is. As a goddess, Ishtar would naturally have all of her authorities available to her, these being the administrative privileges to do literally whatever you wanted with the concept you had authority over. Just like how Ishtar's power was contained within her royal garments during her descent to the underworld, her shining crown is what contains each of her seven divine authorities. But due to being a pseudo-servant in Babylonia, she can barely use any of them at all. Of the ones we know she has, first there's her authority over Venus. It was long believed that Ishtar's movements imitated that of the planet Venus, so many people began to believe that Ishtar was the goddess of Venus. This granted her the authority to manage the entire planet at will. Move it, duplicate it, destroy it, shoot it out of her bow like an arrow, whatever she wanted to do with Venus, she could make happen. And the same goes for her authority over the harvest, giving her powers that can manipulate the fertility of the earth. What this means is that she can create apocalyptic-like famines or bountiful harvests at will. This also extends to the ability to control floodwaters and tides. I'm sure that can be even further extended via her power of creation, an authority that stems from her connection to the original Earth Mother Goddess. It's pretty interesting that she has it, considering that she's actually a goddess of heaven and not of earth. Regardless, it's a very high level skill that only mother goddesses like Ishtar, Tiamat, or Artemis can possess, and it seems to manifest within each goddess differently. Then there's her authority over the bull of heaven, but since this ties into her second noble phantasm, I'll talk about it a little bit later. Anyway, we really only get to see Ishtar use her authority over Venus and none of the others. As I said, pseudo-servant Ishtar is much weaker than her servant and divine spirit form, and both of those are far cries away from the full power of the true goddess Ishtar. So what we see in Fate Grand Order is probably Ishtar's weakest form, and is limited to only her class skills and single noble phantasm. I mean, she does have two noble phantasms, but one of them she's unable to use because her Fate Strange Fake counterpart summoned it away from her. Yep. An alternate version of Ishtar that embodies the goddess as she was during her true divinity, literally isekai'd the Bull of Heaven from the world of Fate Grand Order to Fate Strange Fake. Thus why Ishtar can't summon Gugulana to fight Tiamat. So yeah, if you're not familiar with the multiverse of fate then try not to worry about it too much. Now, her other noble phantasm is probably one of my personal favorites because it literally involves her shooting an entire planet. But to understand how this noble phantasm works, you first need to understand how her bow works. Ishtar's main weapon is the heavenly boat, Mana, the literal boat of the gods that triples as an interstellar teleportation stargate, airship, and bow. She can control the movements of this weapon at will and fire energy-based projectiles from it. As a goddess, this bow would allow her to instantly open up a teleportation gate that connects Earth to the space around Venus. But as a servant, that functionality is sealed away. It only ever becomes available when she's using her noble phantasm. Mountain Range Shaking Firewood of Venus As all noble phantasms usually do, this one derives from a defining moment in Ishtar's legend. It's a representation of the myth where Ishtar comes across a mountain whose natural beauty far surpasses her own. Being a goddess of beauty meant that this mountain's very existence was an affront on her own authority. Therefore, she thought that it shouldn't be allowed to exist. 
So she trampled over the entire mountain with an increasing amount of divine force in every step, eventually causing the entire thing to collapse. It was a feat so intimidating that it even made the other gods tremble in fear. And it's this act of annihilating an entire mountain that's replicated by this noble phantasm. First, Ishtar activates mana's warp function to open up a portal to Venus as it was during the Age of the Gods. Then, using her authority as a goddess of Venus, she creates a copy of the entire planet, projects it into a form that's shootable from her bow, then fires it like an arrow towards her enemy, dealing an impact strong enough to shatter entire mountains. To be honest, it was pretty epic seeing her open up the portal to Venus in the anime. I mean, I was already expecting something extravagant, but they really did a good job here. But anyway, Ishtar still has a few more skills and items that grant her more power. As a goddess of heaven, she has the ability to continuously float or fly. She's free from the restraints that a goddess of the earth would typically have. Then, just like during her descent to the underworld, Ishtar possesses seven divine treasures, the royal garments that were stripped from her at the gates of Kerr, each of which grants some powerful effect or ability. One that we see her have is her shining crown, which, as we know, holds her divine authorities. Another was her lapis lazuli necklace. But during the anime, this item was actually broken, causing any buffs it gave to not only revert the effect but also apply the opposite. This meant that Ishtar was willingly taking more damage. Aside from those treasures, Ishtar also possesses a massive warhammer. But due to her commitment to the archer role, we never actually get to see her use it. Instead, she prefers to use concentrated beams of energy, attacks that are attributed to her mana burst skill. Under normal circumstances, Ishtar would be able to add excessive magical energy to boost the attacks of any of her weapons. But once again, a limiting factor on her pseudo-servant body is that she can only apply this influx of mana to jewels, turning them into powerful projectiles. Though some can take as long as up to 30 seconds to charge in order to get max power from it. It's a significant handicap to the original goddess Ishtar who normally has complete mastery over her divine energy. Finally, Ishtar's pseudo-servant form has also deranked her powerful manifestation of beauty skill into the much simpler charisma skill. Her authority as a goddess of beauty would normally allow her to easily seduce others. In turn, this could apply curses or even seal away the skills of an enemy. Unfortunately, these restriction effects no longer work due to the influence of her human host. So, I think by now it's pretty clear that the Fate Grant Order Babylonia Ishtar was significantly handicapped. Any servant or even divine spirit form of her will always pale in comparison to her true goddess form. She does have the ability to regress back to the Age of Gods and regain some of her original divine powers. But once again, that's something that we didn't see her use. If anything, it could just be something restricted to her Fate Strange Fake version. But yeah, that's Ishtar for you. A goddess whose impulsive nature led her down a path of constant desire, never being satisfied with what she had and constantly trying to take more for herself. It's a relentless form of pride that is only suppressed by the persevering nature of the humans she possesses. In the end, it makes her servant form much more bearable. Now, even though I did make fun of her a little bit in the beginning, I actually do prefer her over Ereshkigal. But let's be honest, OG Rin is the best. And if you think otherwise, then you can fight me in the comments. Anyway, be sure to vote in the community poll for the next servant you want to see covered. Now, before I go, I'd like to thank Crunchyroll once again for sponsoring this video. Don't forget, you can use crunchyroll.com slash news or the link in the description and get a 14-day free trial of Crunchyroll Premium today. And trust me, that Tower of God adaptation is definitely going to be worth looking into. Anyway, as always, thank you so much for watching, and if you enjoyed this type of anime content, then you already know what to do. So, until next time, ciao!